They wriggle and shimmy in a fashion to outdo a congress of eels. And they fling their limbs about without stopping to make sure that they are securely fastened on. New York Herald Tribune, May 24, 1921. Look out. Let him. Let him, boy. Chef Lalonde was very popular. It was a very clever show, very fast moving, lots of good dancing, of course. Siegfeld had to pick that up, you know, because it was the, the talk of the town. Siegfeld is asking in the dancers and singers and performers from Shuffle Along to teach his own chorus girls. Many, many people were influenced by Shuffle Along. Irving Berlin said he went back to see it many times, and there's no question that the Gershwins were influenced by it. For nearly two years, it was always packed. Shuffle Along gave a scintillating send-off to that Negro Vogue in Manhattan. It gave the proper push that spread to books, African sculpture, music, and dancing. Langston Hughes. The unexpected hit inspired a spate of new black musicals, which in turn generated interest in Harlem nightclubs that featured a new generation of black entertainers. Harlem and Broadway are having a final time in the 20s. A lot of your top jazz performers, whether it's Fats Waller, Louis Armstrong, James P. Johnson, they are playing in Harlem nightclubs. They are also writing songs for Broadway reviews and appearing in them. There was this period in which you know, everybody was sleeping across borders and boundaries. There was this incredible cross-fertilization, cultural appropriation. It's like in the, in the 20s, everybody had permission to, to visit each other's lands and see what they were doing. Broadway's most contagious contribution to the jazz age came from a black show with a white producer. George White. Running Wild brought flapping elbows and bumping knees to the entire country with a dance called the Charleston. George White liked to think that he invented 1920s dance. He liked to think that he was the guy that said, I've got this great dance here, here it is, the Black Bottom, the Charleston. So many of the moves that were associated with the 20s. Whether he actually invented these dances, the fact was he put them before the public in a way that the same way that you couldn't get a tune out of your head, you couldn't get White's dances out of your feet. That was what he did. George White was one of the great review men. He did the scandals. And because he himself was a dancer, he respected terrific dancers. And he got a lot of wonderful dancers. And he hired an incredibly gifted young composer very early on in the series named George Gershwin. And George Gershwin really learned his craft writing for the George White scandals. of the melting pot of New York City itself. This would allow for many kinds of music, black and white, eastern and western, and would call for a style that should achieve out of this diversity an artistic unity. George Gershwin. George Gershwin's childhood was the perfect preparation for capturing the rhythms of New York's melting pot. Born in Brooklyn in 1898, 
His parents were Russian immigrants who constantly moved about the city, living in 28 apartments in all. First trained on a piano purchased for his older brother, Ira, George quit high school and found a job as a song plugger, demonstrating material on Tin Pan Alley. He used to make $15 a week at Remix. In vaudeville days, that's where people went to, to Remix to hear the music, and they'd always say, go to the room that George was in with the upright piano, and he'd play for people who wanted to know how songs would sound. You have him at the store plugging songs. It's a very American notion that somebody could come in and, like, test drive a car. They want to test drive a song. He got very good at improvising and selling the song. And he developed his, in his piano style, which became his writing style. He was a composer who wrote very much from what he was able to play. If you see Gershwin's piano rolls played, you can't believe it because there seem to be 20 fingers flying in every direction. And he found in his fingers voicings and jazz sounds. To move up in the world of Tin Pan Alley, George Gershwin went to see Irving Berlin. He knew, as everybody did, that Irving Berlin could not read music and could only play the piano in one key. And he needed someone who could listen to him play and then write the notes down. To audition for the job, George took one of Irving Berlin's songs, sat down at the piano, and played it dynamically. And Berlin said to George Gershwin, don't be my secretary, kid. Go out and write your own songs. When Gershwin wasn't plugging tunes on Tin Pan Alley, he hung out in saloons and cabarets in Hell's Kitchen and Harlem, where black musicians were transforming ragtime into jazz. James P. Johnson and Lucky Roberts told me of this very talented Ofe piano player at Remix. He was good enough to learn some of those difficult tricks that only a few of us could master. Ubi Blake. George Gershwin was a rehearsal pianist, accompanist to vaudeville people. He was writing songs for reviews for anyone who would take his songs and perform them. And he wrote a song, Al Jolson heard it at a party. And he liked the song so much, he recorded it in early 1920, and it was the most successful song in George Gershwin's whole life. He never had another song come close to the sales of Swanee. Swanee, how I love you, how I love you, my dear old Swanee. I'd give the world to be among the folks in D-I-X. I even know my mammy's waiting for me, praying for me down by the Swanee. Writing music for four of the George White scandals and seven Broadway shows throughout the 20s, George Gershwin filled Broadway with his own unique style of jazz music. George Gershwin loomed above the crowd like an enormous spotlight. Melodies leaked from his fingertips. Innovative, beautiful, Rhythmic. We saw a, a Gershwin musical called Tiptoes with a girl named Queenie Smith. It was dazzling, the first musical I ever saw. It was unbelievable. Sweet and Low Down is an amazing number, and it was visually something that people who saw never forgot and he had people on the stage with trombones. Gershwin's music was so infectious that when the cast played their trombones and stomped their feet, the audience stomped along as well. Tip 
Toes featured lyrics by George's older brother, Ira, who became known as the jeweler because of his ability to set words into musical phrases. Ira's first Broadway show with his brother was Lady Be Good in 1924, which starred Fred Astaire and his sister Adele. That show produced one of the Gershwin's most enduring hits, originally titled Syncopated City. One of the most intricate rhythmical songs that anybody had written for a Broadway musical. Poor Ira, when he heard George play the melody with very tricky, irregular rhythms, said, George, how can I set words to that? And his next thought was, still, it's a fascinating rhythm. Fascinating rhythm, got me on the go. Fascinating rhythm, I'm on a pretty bird. A lot of mess you make him, the neighbors wanna know. Why I'm always shaking, just like a pill bird. Each morning I get up with a start. Start hopping, never stopping. By that night, the work has been done. I know that life's a bit better, but now you're doing wrong when you start to pattern. Fascinating rhythm seemed to capture what George's music captured, the energy of the jazz age, the feel of New York. Fascinating rhythm, you gotta stop making on me. The rhythms of the Gershwin shows are jazz-like. When you think of George and Ira shows, you think of Coney Island hot dog stands, lights coming on in the twilight, of tap dancing chorus girls. Fascinating rhythm, you've got to stop making on me. I think George and Ira Gershwin are really the minstrels of the jazz age. Broadway musicals and musical reviews are really integral to a kind of revolution that goes on in the American language in the 1920s. One humorist said that when we Americans get through with the English language, it's going to look like it's been run over by a musical comedy. Another bride, another groom, the countryside is all in bloom. The flowers and trees, the birds and bees are making whoopee. The quiet thing. This is an era when Americans really become conscious of how wonderfully vibrant their language is. He's lost his reason, cause it's the season for making whoopee. And the language is being registered by songwriters, but also by journalists, so that Walter Winchell can take a term like uh, whoopee, which is a code word for sex, and then a Broadway songwriter, Gus Kahn, can write a song for Eddie Cantor called Makin' Whoopee. You'd better keep her. You'll find it's cheaper than making whoopee. And you begin getting, particularly around Broadway, uh, a new argot that is coming out. Uh, you're getting words like turkey click, hit, fan, these wonderful words that are coming out of Broadway and then disseminated by radio and, and syndicated newspapers around the country. Writing in a staccato style punctuated by dots and dashes, one newspaper columnist held sway as the bard of Broadway, Walter Winchell. He turned the page into a stage. Commence. You put on the nickel. I want to talk to Walter Winchell of the Daily Mirror. Speaking, what's on your alleged mind? Out there in America, people heard about this racy land of jazz and dance and drinking and parties and sexy, beautiful people through Walter Winchell. In today's column, what in the devil did you mean when you said one of the STEM's most prominent phonies went gay in a whoopee asylum the other morning and sacked four Chicago gorillas and then had to spend plenty on giggle waters to square themselves? Well, that's Broadway slang. It's Broadway slang, and it means that one of the four flushes along the main stem 
went into a nightclub and got very intoxicated. And then he spoke out of turn to four tough guys from Chicago and to keep from being taken for a ride, he had to spend a lot of money on a lot of laughing soup. A lot of what? A lot of fun milk. I don't get you. Oh, a lot of joy juice, a lot of dream syrup. You know, fire water, whiskey. Oh. Winchell's nicknames for Broadway celebrated all its various guises. The hardened artery, the big gulch, the grandest canyon, Baloney Boulevard, and most famously, the Big Apple. It is the Big Apple, the goal of all ambition, the pot of gold at the end of a drab and somewhat colorless rainbow. The moniker for Broadway soon became a symbol for the entire city. This is Miss Merrill, the feature writer of the United Syndicate. Mr. Hart? How do you do? Mr. Rogers? How do, How do you do? She'd like to do a story with you. Gentlemen, you're about to be interviewed. Wait till I fix my tie. Don't you like being interviewed? Well, I don't mind. As long as you don't ask us which we write first, the words or the music. I'm not going to ask you that. I think our readers will be more interested in knowing how you get the idea. You tell her, Larry. Oh, no. You tell her, Dick. The composer Richard Rogers was born in Upper Manhattan, raised in a middle-class Jewish family, and weaned on comic operas and the music of Jerome Kern. His partner, the lyricist Lorenz Hart, showed an early gift for poetry and delighted in the lyrics of the Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. Despite placing a song in a Broadway show in 1919, real success eluded them. Producers and music publishers alike rejected their work. But in 1925, they finally broke through. What a beautiful, tough, hard-hearted town it is. What? Oh, Manhattan. 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 We'll have Manhattan, Manhattan, the Bronx, Bronx and Staten, Staten Island, too. It's lovely going through the zoo. It's very fancy on old Delancey Street, you know. The subway charms us so when balmy breezes... No one was more surprised by the success of Manhattan than the lyricist Larry Hart. He had always assumed that witty, clever lyrics never became popular on Tin Pan Alley. And he had written in Manhattan one of the cleverest of all lyrics uh, that had been written up to that point. We'll have Manhattan, the Bronx and Staten Island too. And tell me what street compares with Mott Street in July. Sweet pushcarts gently glide, ding by. It's very intricate the way it works with Rogers' music. A great big city's a wondrous toy Just made for a girl and boy Will turn Manhattan into an isle of joy It became an enormous hit around the country. And people then began, for the first time, to listen to the lyrics in American Broadway musicals the way they had always listened to them in Gilbert and Sullivan. It was a new age of lyrics in the Broadway musical. In a show called Connecticut Yankee, Hart combined the old English world of King Arthur with the new American vernacular. Thou swell, thou witty, thou sweet, thou grand, wouldst kiss me pretty, wouldst hold my hand, both mine eyes are cute to what they do to me. Hear me holler, I choose a sweet lala, palooza is thee. I'd feel so rich in a heart for two, two rooms and kitchen, I'm sure would do. Give me just a plot of not a lot of land, and thou swell, thou witty, thou grand. In 1927, the year Connecticut Yankee opened, the team of Rogers and Hart had four shows on Broadway. 
Dick Rogers was only 25 years old. Larry Hart, 32. They were part of a new generation of songwriters that was busy making Broadway the place to be. Richard Rogers once described to me, opening nights, he and all, the, all his colleagues, all the other composers, would go to everybody's opening night. And Gershwin, for example, would come out with a wonderful new rhythm or a syncopation or something, and Rogers would race right home and have to top it. Everyone knew everyone. Everyone read the same newspapers. Everybody read the same columns. And once you were accepted on Broadway, either as a performer or a writer, or you created a show that was a hit, then you were ready for the whole world. Nineteen twenty-seven was a giddy time for Broadway, for Wall Street, and for Main Street, USA. Americans had heroes with nicknames like the Sultan of Swat and Lucky Lindy. Women's skirts were the shortest of the decade, and the world was listening to Broadway tunes on the radio, on phonograph recordings, and in dance halls and nightclubs. Broadway celebrated the reckless exuberance of youth, flappers, fads, and the latest dance craze. The biggest hit that year was Good News, with a score by the trio De Silva, Brown, and Henderson. The first act dance number was known as the Varsity Drag. Ira and George Gershwin heard from their own mother, why can't you write hits like De Silva, Brown, and Henderson?